everyone and welcome back to what is the first podcast of 2023 my name is daniel franco managing director of synergy iq and host of the creating synergy podcast and today's podcast is a journey like no other this podcast has it all there was laughter there were heartstrings pulled there were tears there was suspense there was all in all a story of resilience perseverance and growth. I was lucky enough to sit down with the amazing Claire Parkinson, a current member of the senior executive team at Oz Minerals. Claire's journey is truly inspiring. And at the age of 16 years old, Claire became a mother and was consequently kicked out of her home. It was here that she decided that packing her bags and heading for Turkey to become a holiday rep was her calling and this is where she describes her life as chaotic, immature and self-indulgent. Then one day, by a twist of fate, Claire landed work in a prison in London and this is when she then truly began to flourish. Claire then overcame her early life challenges and went on to hold leadership roles in various sectors including the prisoner, governor and head of operations for all London prisons. She also became a qualified hostage negotiator and shares with us a thrilling story about how she used her skills in a high stakes situation whilst applying a change management lens on how communication, context and perspective underpin success in overcoming complex challenges. Claire was then headhunted to come over here to South Australia where she picked up her young family and set sail. It's from here she's led major reform across the justice sector in South Australia and has developed Developed and executed one of South Australia's largest infrastructure projects, the North South Interconnector. Claire's passion for change and innovation shines through as she talks about her experience in helping leaders create environments that strive for growth and enable complex change. This is such a riveting conversation and one where Claire brings a wealth of knowledge and unique perspective on leadership, communication and conflict resolution. So without further ado, here is my conversation with Claire Parkinson. So welcome back to the Creating Synergy podcast. Today, I have the amazing and wonderful Claire Parkinson on the show. Thank you for joining us. A pleasure to be here. Can I, can I just call out the casual Friday? <laughs> you like, can. <laughs> why have you come in all dapper and looking all smart and oh. I'm rocked up in T-shirt and jeans? I didn't get the brief. <laughs> You look great. Don't worry about your attire. That's the right answer. <laughs> Thank you for coming on. I've been actually really excited about this. Your story is amazing. Your career is uh, amazing, and your um, and your brain is amazing. So I'm really interested in unpacking all the above uh, as a as a way of introduction for those who may may not know Claire. She's the inter integration executive at Oz Minerals, previously the change execution lead and head of corporate affairs and head of innovation at Oz Minerals. You've run your own consultancy firm for a while. Uh, in that, you uh, were strategic comms on the transforming Wyala project for GFG. You uh, ran a uh, um, worked in various government contracts and responsible for the North South Interconnector, which was one of the biggest projects here in South Australia that we've done in a in a long, long time. Accountable for developing major reform across the justice sector. Um, you've led South Australian flagship prisons, which is a, like a, a world that we don't really hear a, a much about. Uh, Director of External Affairs. Uh, at the South Australian Chamber of Mines and Energy, Head of Business Performance at Bank SA, Head of Operations at Guide Dogs, and you ran um, the Her Majesty's Prison and Probation Service where you had $1 billion contracts, led 9,000 staff, 33,000 offenders. Amazing story. So I'm just Sounds a, pretty cool when you summarise it like that, it but did. I am quite old, <laughs> so it's not as cool as it sounds. <laughs> it is. It's an amazing career and there's so much to unpack. You're clearly making a difference in this world. So to understand you and to understand the trajectory of your life and how you've ended up sitting here today, what do we need to understand about your early context? Okay, so probably probably the best place to take me back to is the 1970s. I'm not going to give you I'm not going to give you a year in the 70s, but mm. it, it was in the 70s. Yeah. Okay, so yeah. I'm not a baby boomer <laughs> just quite. 
Um, so my formative years were spent in the 70s and um, Maggie Thatcher was the Prime Minister. Yeah. And um, arguably, she was the most powerful woman in the world. And probably to this point, she yeah. is um, still remembered as the most powerful woman in the world. Yeah. Lover or hater, she was. Mm -hmm. um, and I used to watch on um, on the little black and white TV and um, think there is no way on this planet I want to have a job where I am in a position of power. I don't ever want to be the leader. I don't ever want to be a CEO. And by God, I don't ever want to be the prime minister. So I didn't really have many aspirations other than to not get too high in the ladder. I was quite happy living in my little social housing estate, had the best life ever. I don't know how many houses there was, maybe a thousand houses, you know, didn't have to cross a road to get to school. Um, it was pretty safe, um, you know, very, very working class yeah. um, and pretty much a good childhood. Um, so that kind of like set the foundations of, not really aspiring to do much, yep. if I'm honest. Um, and then when I was about 14, my mum um, cleaned a factory and she managed to persuade her boss to give me a job helping her out. Yeah. And I used to clean a row. I always say 18 urinals, um, but I think I might be exaggerating. You know, there's, there probably wasn't 18. There was probably only about six. But let's just, let's just go with the 18 yeah. urinals because it sounds much more sexy and yeah. much more vivid. <laughs> so there was a row of 18 urinals and... I used to clean them every day between 5 and 6 p.m. And Sounds like fun. Men's or women's? Your rhinos. <laughs> Did you just ask me that? Uh, well, sorry, yeah. You're, yeah, it's, yeah. It's, it's the yeah, one yeah. where you stand. Yeah, the stand. Yeah, um, okay. Yeah, you're right. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I was just thinking, I was just thinking It's toilet. Friday. It's, I'll, I'll forgive I was, you. I was just thinking toilets, but yes. I okay. forgive you. Yeah, it's yeah. Friday. Yeah, yeah. Um, so, um, yeah, that sounds like. So I used to clean them. A lot of fun. And I wasn't, yeah, it was, wasn't a lot of fun, <laughs> but there was, there was a process. Yeah, yeah. I had to plan it. I had to strategically organise when I was going to do them because it was in a factory, male-dominated factory. In fact, I don't think there was any women that actually worked there outside of admin. So I had to be really strategic about when I did it to get them all done in a row without anybody coming in. And I failed miserably because <laughs> the guys would just come in. And I just used to stand to one side and just, like, turn my eyes away and not look and I'd have my rubber gloves on and my bleach blocks and I'd be like oh, my God, like, this is so hard. Like, how do I plan? How do I do this? Yeah. And that was my first taste of um, work. How old were you at that point? 14. 14. Um, it was only like an hour a day, five yeah. days a week. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But that was my first kind of gig. Yeah. And it was pretty tough. It but I, I started to learn yeah. how to work in a male-dominated environment, if you like, mm. and how to navigate the uh, the things that I could see but I didn't want to see yeah. and how to work out how to get a solution in that hour knowing that, my work was constantly being interrupted and constantly being soiled, if you like. Yeah. And, and um, <laughs> so, yeah, that that was kind of like my early start. And then, you know, I delivered Yellow Pages, became an Avon lady. I did any anything that gave me pocket money. Yeah. Um, and then I did pretty much what most of the people um, that I knew and loved did in the 80s and thought, oh, I don't know what I'll do, I'll have a baby. Mm. So I was pregnant very, very early on. I was pregnant at 16. So yeah. um, thankfully, um, my school career, um, I'd managed to sit my year 12 exams at 15 because I was pretty good at maths and English. Mm -hmm. So I'd managed to get them out of the way before the interruption yeah, wow. of being pregnant. Thank goodness. At the time, I didn't appreciate it. I was like, what do you mean I'm yeah. clever? I can do them a year early. Like, yeah. damn. But I did. So it wasn't a planned pregnancy. No, no it wasn't it, a planned no, pregnancy. Was... But I mean, you know, Captain Obvious in hindsight, yeah, you know, yeah. these things do happen mm. if you don't unplan them. Yeah, correct. You, you, um, there's a certain... There's a certain, there's, there's a certain there's, biology to this. Yeah, <laughs> it's not rocket science. Um but yeah, that's kind of that's kind of where my world fell at sixteen, and and actually it was, you know, in my in my immature brain at the time, it was um, kind of expected and kind of normal and just what we did, mm. and from that point on, you know, my life just pretty much spiraled and mm. got a little bit out of control, and I just lost. I just lost whoever I was meant to be in that time. And actually, arguably, maybe I was meant to be that crazy young girl who was selfish and, you know, did whatever job paid the bills, didn't worry about the future too much, um, just literally lived, you know, cash handout to cash handout to cash handout, um, didn't really think about a home, didn't think about any of the relationships I had in terms of my family. I was just 
self-indulgent, immature chaos from that point onwards, I think it's fair to say. Mm. Being a mother at that age uh, can, can come with it some embarrassment, can, can come with it some shame, right? Like it's a, obviously not planned. It's, you talked about chaos. How did you manage the cocktail of emotions at that age? Uh, I was too immature to too, manage them. Yeah. Um, I, I probably wasn't aware of them. Mm. You know, it was, um, it was a very immature, superficial emotion. It was, you know, things like, um, you know, when am I going to be able to put my skinny jeans back on? Mm. You know, how am I going to go to a disco now? Mm. Um, you know, where am I going to live? Just... Just stuff that I don't. I don't even think I thought too deeply about any of it. Yeah. I just needed. I just needed a job. It didn't matter what the job was. Um, anybody who would pay me a, some small bit of cash to nanny their children, to do babysitting, to do cl their cleaning for them, to pick up their groceries for them, anything at all that would just pay for a new pair of sneakers for my son or, mm. or myself, mm. you know, or just you know, pay for a nice new secondhand table for my new dining room, um, you know, or, or whatever it was, it was quite shallow yeah. and wasn't really future-proofing anything yeah. I was doing. Was I was just, just surviving. Just surviving. Had your parents, did they accept the situation? Uh, I, don't, I mean, accept is a strong word. Yeah. Um, I think... I think the word I would probably use is um, it, they were hurt um, and deeply disappointed and, and, it, and it was pretty clear that, mm. you know, I was not going to be able to stay with my parents when they found out. Okay. So they kicked you out of home? It's a strong word, but mm. I guess you could argue, yes, I did not have anywhere to live at that point, yeah. Bef so what happened when the child came? Where were you...? So when he came... Um, Sorry, and he is... What's his name? His name's Liam. Liam, that's right. Yeah, he's yeah. 34 now. Yeah, that makes me really old, yeah, right? Yeah, so we can figure out your age. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Actually, <laughs> he's 35. Yeah, he's 35 in <laughs> um, Yeah, you can figure out my age. God damn. And I'm on camera, so you can see me going red. 50, 50's a new 40, right? Yeah, well done. Congrats. Um, so... So me and his dad were obviously both children. Yeah. So I just clarify that now we were the same age. Yeah. Um, yeah. 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 And um, his mum and dad um, owned a public house, a, mm -hmm. a, a pub. Yep. And um, eventually, we were given a. Um, she let us stay in there, not in the pub. In she had like a, a house nearby that we eventually moved into. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Yeah, but there was a there was a void. Yeah, there was a void of 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 unpleasantness where, you know, I stayed wherever I could. Mm. Yeah, which was pretty dark, pretty dark times. If you, like, if Claire Parkinson was standing in front of her sixteen year old self today, mm -hmm. what would you be saying? Ooh, back yourself. Trust your instincts. It's going to be a hell of a ride. Mm. Enjoy it. Yeah. Is that pre-baby or, or? Probably both. Yeah. Yeah, probably both. Yeah. I probably wouldn't change anything, actually. Yeah. Um, I mean, why would you? you got a beautiful young son. Well, he's old. Yeah, we, well. Yeah, he's got three kids of his own now. Yeah. He's not, um, he's not old. <laughs> well, my well, 34. <laughs> he's not, he's not, old compared to my other child. <laughs> yeah, well, that's like, true. Like, yeah, yeah. Um, he's m more no, mature. No, I probably, I mean, he, even even him aside, I probably wouldn't change any of it. Yeah. Because it, it kind of instills the chaos and the immaturity and the unsurety of what tomorrow brings or what next week brings. Builds, builds something that doesn't normally come innate with us. Yeah. It just it just builds something. You don't even know it at the time. Mm. Um, but I look back and I think, oh yeah, I get that. I now know why I do that. Mm. I now know, you know, if I if there's issues that we all have as adults that you know come back to our childhood or what have you, you mm. go, oh, that's where that came from. Mm. That's what. That's what. That's my why. Mm. So I don't regret it. None of it. No. I, there's a podcast that I've listened to recently, which is and and um. 
well, there's a guy by the name of Mo Gord that he's interviewed uh, 12,000 people as part of his book research and 12,000 people, um, he asked them about trauma in their life. I'm not suggesting this was trauma, but it was about trauma in their life and saying, if, if you could, would you go back and change, knowing that every lesson you learnt along the way or every person you met would also be erased. Mm. And I think the, out of those 12,000 people, 99.9% .9 said, no, they wouldn't change anything. Mm. So we are, as humans, we, as things happen and as we make mistakes and as we, we – but we learn from them, there is yeah. always a silver lining. So I think the beauty in that is as we're going through these tough times, think at some point we're going to look back and go or even think at that point say what can we learn from this Where, what can we actually gain from this and how is this helping me right now so during that phase when in some of our previous conver conversations you've said what you learned most and what that era of your life taught you was resilience yes can you explain to me how that um, attributes to your life today so I, I, I love the word grit. Yeah. It's like, you know, I was reading an article um, recently about um, the new, you know, since COVID's hit, the new number one skill that's required to be in the C-suite is grit. Yeah. And then actually um, grit is the ability to have courage and be brave and continue on even in, you know, the most darkest of times. Um, and I, th I think that we all have... We all have grit mm. to varying levels and we all have dark times in our lives and we all have grief that comes with that. And I think that my journey isn't unique. It's unique to me, but it's not unique. There are mm. people with far, far worse and far so much more tragedy. Um, but every single person who has something in their life that doesn't go to plan, that they get through, they get through with grit. They get through with courage to wake up the next day and get out of bed. They get through with, you know, crying and saying, it's okay that actually I'm vulnerable. It's okay that I'm grieving. It's okay that I've lost the person I love. It's okay that actually I've got this illness um, and I've got to live with this for the rest of my life and I don't know where it's going to go and that's just my truth. That's grit. Mm. So I think... Everything that's ever happened in my world has brought me to a point where I have a level of grit that I'm comfortable with. I'd like more. There are still days when I'm like, oh, my God, you know, really? Is there anything else that can happen today? Mm. Um, there are days like that. Um, but, of course, there's always something else that can happen. Yeah. You know, I've woke up on the right side of the soil every single day. So I'm bloody grateful because mm. there's a lot of people that didn't this morning. Correct. Yeah. Yeah, grit is one of our values here at Synergy IQ. It's something that we hold very dear to our heart. And it, you're right, it, it is something uh, any entrepreneur, any business leader, any C-suite executive would understand that when you choose leadership or you choose entrepreneurship or you choose to lead business in any way, shape or form, um, even if you choose to be a parent, right, you choose heartache, you choose stress, you choose ambiguity yeah um and grit is that thing that keeps you going it's yeah. the thing that you you can turn to there's a book uh called a load Res a, a, a road less traveled by scott peck and i remember i picked it up once uh, to read it it's on my bookshelf but i've literally only ever read the first couple of lines of this book and then i put it back on the shelf because it actually served its purpose uh, purpose and the first few lines say life is hard and the, the quicker we realize that life is hard, the easier life becomes. And I was like, yeah, that's enough for me. I think I'll, uh, I'll take my lesson out of that. Because if we go in with the expectation that things, is gonna, things are going to be easy, then we're setting ourselves up for failure, aren't we? Absolutely. And it sounds to me that you've had a few lessons in your life which have really shaped you and, and made you the person who you are today. I want to ask you around the next phase so liam's come along you're bootstrapping you're trying to make ends meet where does life take you at this point so i would fast forward to 1996 so i was a bit wild right so yeah. liam came along in 1988 i did any job that would just give me enough money to buy nappies yep 
to buy him his the sneakers he wanted or whatever it whatever it was I made ends meet week to week and um in 1996 I went on holiday with a girlfriend we did a week in Mallorca and it opened up my world you know that I'm uh, you know somebody who didn't travel abroad yeah. um, and I was like here I was went to Magaluf um, with a girlfriend and it was young single beautiful people having a great time and I was like oh my goodness I've missed this like where has this been my life this is not a this is not a universe that I've had any exposure to and I decided at that point that one of our um, holiday reps had the coolest job and that I wanted to be a holiday rep. <laughs> and I, God damn it, I was going to be a holiday rep. I did not think about the consequences of anyone around me. I just wanted that person's job. His name was Matt. I can't remember what his surname was. But he bleached his hair. He just stood out and I just thought, I want to be you when I grow up. Yeah, wow. So I got back to, um, got back to the UK and said to my parents, I'm going to be a holiday rep. And, of course, they just rolled their eyes you're ridiculous. <laughs> yes, that may be, that may be, but I need to get off this merry-go-round of not owning a home, not owning a car um, and not having a life. I just, I just need to figure out who I am because I just need to have a future. Of course, they just rolled their eyes again because, you know, I said that weekly yeah. as, as we do. And, and they just thought you were looking for a party. They okay. just thought I was selfish. Yeah. And, you know, and, and yes, I was. Mm. You know, I was being selfish. So um, so I went for the job interview. Um, in hindsight, it bombed. We went to Blackpool and the job interview was, you know, we had a stage. There was, you know, a few hundred people there and we all had to go onto stage, work as a team and, and deliver a presentation of sorts. And I had to sing um, Mustang Sally. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm a really bad singer. Really, even even can I you, can. Can you do a rendition? Yeah. <laughs> no, I don't know. I, Mustang Sally. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. You get you yeah. get the gist, right? Yeah. It's where there's the 16 cats now outside the building, <laughs> waiting to come in and kill me. Right? I've let them down. So anyway, I stung, I stood up on stage to sing Mast Mustang Sally. Didn't really know the words, but it was just the song that came to my mind. Mm. And, um, oh, so you weren't told that was just the thing. No, no, no. Yeah. It just popped in. I, was, yeah. I, I had no idea where yeah. it came from, right? It wasn't go. a song I listened to, maybe the radio. I don't know. I just, I, I was under pressure. Not the most flowing song either. Mm, no, <laughs> definitely not. And, and I sang Mustang City. <laughs> and everyone in the audience was shouting. And I thought they were shouting and hooping and clapping and waving because I was awesome. And I sang all the way through. And to be honest, the only two words I know is Mustang Sally. <laughs> and but you didn't I, even I, get them I, I, didn't, I got 50% of them wrong. So I was like, Mustang City, da -da -da, you're going to slow down. Mustang City. Of course, they were, I thought I'd done awesome, right? I got off the stage. didn't know anyone, thankfully. Got off the stage. Oh. Um, and then that night, the, um, the managers for all the different countries um, came up to the people that they wanted to engage and employ. Yeah. No one came up to me. No, no. And I was like, uh -oh. <laughs> I've even failed. I've even <laughs> failed at this. Anyway, it turns out about a week later, I get I get a, a, a letter because we didn't have email at the time. Get a letter through the posts offering me um, a job in Turkey. Yeah, wow. And I was like, whoop, whoop, I'm going to Turkey. Yeah, wow. So then I had to organise, you know, my son, what was going to happen with him. So mm. he was going to go and stay with his dad, which was fine. You know, we still had a friendly relationship. Um, he'd married at that time. She was great. Um, so everything in that regard was perfect. Um, and then it was just to tell my parents, I'm going to Turkey. Yeah, um, wow. So, yeah, that went down like a lead balloon, as you could probably imagine. But I, I knew what I was doing. Mm. I was... Finding out who I was, I was going to develop skills that I had never developed, m mature skills at dealing with people and sales. Mm. My job was all commission. Yeah. So if I didn't sell, which meant if I didn't have relationships with people that I was only ever going to know for a maximum of two weeks, I didn't get paid mm. and I didn't eat. So there was no base salary. You took it on the back of me just I being I took it on the sell. back of I've got this. Yeah, wow. I've got this. Did you uh, – did your parents think you were running away from your responsibility? A hundred percent. Yeah. A hundred percent. A hundred percent. And you were actually saying, no, no, this is what's going to make me this more is responsible. What, 
this is this is uh, I couldn't articulate it. Mm. I can articulate it in hindsight, yeah. but at the time I, I couldn't articulate my why. It just yeah. looked like, you know, I was just chasing the dream, mm. but not a dream that was a, a single parent responsibility dream. Yeah. It was a selfish 26-year-old. I want to ask you a question. As a parent, that we're, well, I mean, we're both parents, right? Yeah. Um, if your children decided to do something similar and in a similar situation where they have a young newborn, yeah. how would you react Oh, yeah. I'd, I'd have a complete tanty and yeah. they were being irresponsible, <laughs> yeah, 110%. Yeah. Um, I mean, my, at, at the time, my son was eight, mm-hmm. so he wasn't... Baby, baby. Baby, baby. Yeah, yeah. Um, but it was still, you yeah. know, it was still... I was the primary carer. Yeah. He saw his dad, mm. but, it, you know, the responsibility was on me. And I, and I often reflect and think, okay, if the tables were turned and he did it, would we be having the same conversation? Because we probably wouldn't. Mm. He'd be sending his money home to his ex-wife or mm. his ex-partner and he was doing the responsible thing. But when a woman does it and sends the money home. Yeah, it's, it's a bit different, you it's, reckon? It's, mm. well, it, it, it just it is. is. Yeah. It just is because we have this primary carer bias as humans that mm. the mum needs to – well, he came out. My brother brought him out. So he came out to see me. Yeah. Um, but, yeah, I mean, my heart bleeds a little bit thinking about, you know. How long were you away for? Um, I went in the May and then I came back in the September. So okay. It's good five, six months. Yeah, and he was off school because the UK's summer holidays for school are July through September. So he'd come out in the school holidays. But, yeah, I was gone for a fair while. But I saved. I was number one at sales. Mm. I was ruthless because... I needed to save. Mm. And I had a locker in my hotel reception, you know, the old key yeah. swimming lockers, and I put my cash in there and I stored the whole season's cash earnings in that safe. Yeah, wow. And Why not a bank? At the time, um, it, we were advised not to put our money into the, into the bank over there. Oh, in Turkey, okay. Yeah, we yeah. were advised not to. So, yeah, I just took the advice. I didn't question yeah, okay. Yeah, Makes and then sense. I brought it home in my hand luggage, like, just hoping someone's not going to think yeah. I'm a drug dealer. Yeah, interesting. Yeah. And I, I came home and had a deposit for my first home and bought a car. So what did your parents say then? We didn't talk about it. Okay. We just didn't talk about were it. Were they proud that you'd mm. saved and you'd done what you said you were going to do? No, 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 of course not. You scratched the itch and you learnt. Like to me, sales is probably, if anyone's starting their career, it's probably the one that, like. Someone comes to me and says, Dan, what can I do? Like, I don't know, my life's just, just go work in sales. Oh, like, yeah. Talk to people, yeah. communicate, learn yeah. how to influence. Like, it's change these are, management. Yeah. It's, it's change it, management. It is, yeah. Yeah. It's, uh, Providing the context, showing the value, understanding their story and their why and how this contributes to their story. Yeah. And that's 100%. exactly what the sales was where I was. The reason you need to have this t shirt is because. You're going to be part of this community. This is a great community. We are mm. going to have some fantastic days and nights out. How do I get buy-in? Yeah. Where do you sign? Yeah. Yeah. That skill set, what happens next? Where do you go from there? You learn sales, you come back, you buy a house. I went back the next, I went back the next year. Oh, you went a couple I went, of years? I went so. back. I, went, I, went, I didn't go to Turkey the second time I went to COS. Okay. I didn't have to, I didn't have to Cos? see again. COS? Codamina in okay. Greece. Okay, Greece. Yeah, 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 Greek island. Yeah. So I didn't have to interview again, thankfully. Yeah. Because I, I would have had to rever- rehearse some song <laughs> some lines song. and come up with something, you know. <laughs> Do I you know, know. it's funny. I was thinking uh, my, my mum, um, she was singing a song. It just made me laugh because we used to give her so much shit and you did the same thing. So she was singing a song once and she was like, I'm your Venus, I'm your <laughs> desire. And she thought the words, literally, she's going to kill me for saying this. She thought the words were George Kintyre. <laughs> like, I'm George Kintyre. I'm That's not, okay. I'm your but desire. She was happy. <laughs> Right, it's all about happiness. Yeah, but we're sitting at home one day and she's singing, I'm your Venus, I'm George, I'm like, Who, Mom, who's George Kintyre? <laughs> That's the words. I'm like, no, it's your desire, you idiot. But, and uh, you know what? You ruined her uh, life in that, in that moment there, right? You ruined her happy. Yeah, How right. dare you? How dare you? Yeah, I do that all the time. Brilliant. Yeah. yeah. So let's talk about the next phase. You, yes. You, you, you've learned this new gift. You've built some 
confidence in your own ability to yep. sell, you're yep. saving, yep. life's starting to take a turn, right? You've shifted, you've turned the dial slightly. Yep. And not had a lot of fun. Yeah. Don't get me wrong, yeah. there was a lot of pie. Yeah. And you said that to me in a previous uh, in a previous conversation that um, yeah, that you're, there was a part of your life which was the sex, drugs, rock and roll type 100%. part. Yeah. And do you look back now and go, that actually made me who I am or, yeah, is that? hundred percent. Yeah. Yep, a hundred percent because, because like, I mean, we'll go into how I got into prison, right? Yeah. Um, but what that did was that furnished everything I needed without judgment mm. to do my job effectively mm. because I'd walked a mile in their shoes. Yeah, okay. that, I, know that's, I know it sounds like a cliche, but I had. Yeah. And I very easily, very easily could have gone on the wrong path had I not had that circuit breaker, which was absolutely going to Turkey and Greece. The circuit breaker that said, I am worthy and I am more than just a Friday queue in the post office to collect my social benefit. Mm. That was my circuit breaker. It's an amazing story because you learn this skill and I'm, I'm, I'm going to push this again. I, the sales element, the, it's not just about selling and, getting, and making money. It's about knowing that you can influence other people in their way of thinking, right? Mm. You can help, you can make people see mm. what you're seeing. Yep. You know, you can change opinion, you can change. That skill set alone has the ability to spark off so many different things. If I can do this, then I can do that, right? Mm. That's the, yep. the idea. So let's talk about how you got into prisons. Well, I came home from, from Greece and um, it was a fateful day. My parents had given me my weekly call to say grow up and get a real job, mm-hmm. and which was pretty consistent and, and to be honest, not, not without cause. Yeah. Um, and they rang me up and they said, grow up and get a real job. And um, in the UK, we have letterboxes. I know you don't have them here. That yeah. was one of my biggest shots. Yeah. I don't know why you don't have letterboxes. Maybe because brown snakes can crawl in. I don't know. Why don't so you have- what, what are we? What do we call them then? Well, I have well, a letterbox have, at the front of my house. Is yeah, that but you not have a mailbox that's not a, attached a mail- to your front door. Oh, okay. It's quite radical. It like, is true. Like anyone just walk by and grab it. Like, but in the, we have like letterbox in our door. Yeah. Like embedded in our door. Yeah, yeah, so yeah. I was like, oh, this so is, is that, interesting. Like, I, I don't know the UK demographic or uh, very well. Probably but because we don't have gardens. Fair that's what I'm and, thinking. Yeah. Is yeah, there? Probably. Yeah. Yeah, probably. Oh, I don't know. Mm. What about the big houses? They would not have uh, on their front door. There would be a gate at the front. Well, if they have a gate, yeah. yeah. But, I mean, how many of them are? You know, most people like me wouldn't have a gate on the you, front house. Yeah. Unless you live in Mayfair or somewhere fancy. Oh, I but in Australia, there. we... But you have them on every we have, house. We have a bigger... Like the, the, the land size the is, is bigger. Do you yeah. think that's what it is? Or are you making <laughs> it up? Are you having a guess? Well, I'm... I'll do a bit of property. I would okay, just assume, just, yeah. Right, I'll, so listeners, we need to do some research. I would, yeah. <laughs> we need to know. Yeah, I mean, who wants to walk all the way to the front door? Just leave it at the front. We're lazy here in Australia. <laughs> I can't say that because I'm a pom, okay? I'm not allowed to say that. <laughs> well, but we are bloody lazy. <laughs> you said it. You heard it here. <laughs> anyway, we've digressed. Yes, <laughs> yes. So, so... um. So, yeah, this, this particular day, and there's a reason I was talking about that letterbox, <laughs> it's this particular day, somebody put the Daily Mail through my letterbox in error. No, I, oh, I yeah. couldn't afford to pay for newspapers, yeah, yeah, right? Yeah. And somebody put what I consider, I don't now, but in those days the Daily Mail was a paper I would have never bought if mm. I was ever going to spend 20 pence on one. I mm. would have always bought the Sun because I liked the pictures, yeah, right? yeah. Somebody put the Daily Mail through my letterbox in error and um, poor paper boy or girl would probably have gotten into trouble for that. Um, so I lay on my floor. I, I vividly remember doing it. I had this like really thin office carpet that had cost me like 70, 70 pence a, a kilometre pretty mm. much. It was shite, quite frankly. Am I allowed to swear? Yes. Okay, shite. It's with an E, so it's not really. No, it's okay. fine. Okay. So, it's, um, it's a fancy way of saying shit. And I lay on the floor <laughs> and it was, it was like, you know, it was, it was bad carpet. Uh, you could feel your hips on. Uh, anyway, I was laying in front on the carpet, <laughs> grey, and um, I was reading this Daily Mail and I went to the job section. I was like, right, I'll bloody show them. 
get a real job. I'll show them. And there was two adverts. There was um, Virgin Atlantic who were looking for air hostesses. And mm-hmm. I was thinking, I can speak a bit of Turkish. Yeah. I could be an air hostess. It's all glamour, you know, all sexy, cool. You know, it was the days where you had to be a certain height. You yeah. had to be a certain weight to yeah. even be shortlisted. I mean, they'd never get away of it now. But in those days, it was. Yeah. I met the criteria. Yeah. I wouldn't now. But then, oh, <laughs> maybe I would now. They've changed it. But then I did. Um, and there was also a job to be a prison officer. And I was like, I don't know anybody who's a prison officer or anybody in prison. But I reckon I could do that. Yeah. I reckon I could. And it's like seven miles down the road. So I was like, I'll apply for that too. Anyway, I got both jobs. It completely pulls apart. In oh, like the, the, I just need – it the, was just money. Yeah. I just – there was – I had no aspirations. Yeah. I didn't want to be Margaret Thatcher and the leader yeah. of anything because that – I'd always seen, you know, that the way she was treated even in death was just horrific. Um and I didn't want to. I didn't want to ever expose myself to that. I just wanted to just have a income mm. and whatever whatever came came. So I applied to um, for both, won them both, and decided that probably being an air hostess wasn't growing up and getting a proper real job because I was still the primary care of a child, and who would look after him when I was away? And my mum and dad would still nag me. Mm. And then the prison officer job required me to travel um, for three months to do my training. And I was like, well, how is that going to happen? Um, but f- they actually changed the rules for me and they paid for my childcare while I went so I could study, yeah, um, wow. which was the first time they'd ever done it. And I will be eternally grateful to them for doing it. Um, and they paid a thousand thousand pounds a yeah, year well, more. Why wouldn't you? So <laughs> uh, it, it was 14,525 14, pounds yeah, per wow. year. Might have been 513. But it's fourteen thousand pounds a year, um, and I got kicked out of college. I was in college; it was like nine weeks. I was party girl, you know. I had mm-hmm. my stomach pumped out, alcohol poisoning the night before I started mm. celebrating getting a proper job. I mean, I was, I was, you know, struggling <laughs> with the responsibility of growing up and getting a real job. It's fair to say. Yeah, wow. Well. Um, and I got kicked out of college for being hijinks, you know, just a clown. I mean, I just was a clown. Um, and then they decided that. There was more to me than met the eye and they were going to continue on and fight for me. And then they sent me to a different college and I did my last three weeks of training and I, I, I passed out. And when I say passed out, I don't mean fainted. Passed out means qualified. Yeah. And I became a prison officer well done. in 1997, 3rd of November, 1997, and um, bought my house at £23,328. Well done. Yes. Bought the house. Yes. Um, so I was, I was a, I was a real boy at that yeah, point. Yeah, well done. Yeah. And then your career just took off. Yes, I mean, who'd have thought, right? Yeah. So when I first started, um, <coughs> my first day, I was allocated personal officer to um, a lady called Myra Hindley, um, who was responsible. She was a Moore's murderer, um, very infamous, notorious, probably. Um, the most notorious in the UK, killed in a number of children horrifically um, with her partner. And I became her personal officer. So my first day, I walk in. You can just imagine, I mean, you know what I'm like. I'm, you know, a little bit, little bit lively. And um, bright-eyed, bushy-tailed, in my, in my 20s, bounced in Myra Hingley. I'd seen her picture all over the telly for years. I'd grown up with this notorious monster of a woman. And there she is in her slippers, smoking a roll-up. Uh, you know, leather friendship band on. I'm like, oh my god, oh my god, is that woman? And I thought to myself, you know, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna have to, I'm gonna have to rem- keep my sense of humour if I'm gonna survive in this world because I was allocated the segregation unit, um, which meant that the only people that came down there were th- those like Myra who were vulnerable to being in real prison population or people that, you know, were awaiting mental health transfer, so dangerous to themselves, or people that were refractory and violent that couldn't mix with mainstream population because they were having a period of their life where they were a risk to others. So I was in this really violent, psychologically challenging environment, like, and and had come from this world of 
all of the above, I think it's fair to say, mm. m- minus minus the uh, the murdering of children. Obviously, yeah. I didn't I didn't I didn't partake in any of that no, activity. No, no. Or hopefully, didn't know anyone else. Because this would be a whole <laughs> never another <laughs> podcast, wouldn't it? <laughs> Inside of the <laughs> yeah. prison cell. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So um, so yeah, that that first year was my grow up point. Mm. That was where I faced um, a mirror of oh my god this is how close i was this is this is the choice that so many of these beautiful beautiful but now damaged humans had taken at 16 similar to me mm-hmm. and had just for whatever reason gone a different path and i don't know what the, i don't know what the difference is because it it wasn't a great path i was on but somehow i had managed to get that circuit breaker, which was going to Turkey away from my community, my projected life yeah. and circuit break and see Best what was possible. Never made. Well, in hindsight, mm. I think it was. In hindsight, I think it was. I'm really interested in the words that you just used then, which was these beautiful yet broken humans. Did yes. you get a chance to know these people really well? Well, of course. The Moira's of the world. Uh, there's a limit, yeah. right? So know people really well. When when you're – Myra had been in prison 30 years plus when I met her. Yeah. Um, so you don't ever get to know someone really, really well unless you live with them and want to get to know them really mm. well. And there was a, you know, a psychological barrier that you just didn't cross with prisoners – you know, I wasn't their friend, mm. but by God, I was going to be respectful to them mm. and I was going to treat them like a human regardless, regardless what they've done, regardless, because my job wasn't to judge. That mm. had already happened. My job was to keep them in custody, treat them fairly, get them home safely if they were going to go home and make sure that they didn't harm themselves, mm. you know, and there's no need to be anything other than human to a human. There's none. So, no, I didn't get to know them because I that would harm me and you can't you can't do that the the word judgment that comes in that you know it's such a, a skill that you've learned on how to not judge right yeah especially when you know that these people have done some crimes that yeah have hurt others how do you not judge in that situation? How do you hold yourself back or control your mind? Did, did you make a decision that these guys, these people are criminals? Um, yeah, I, there's some beauty in, in, in what you're saying and I'm, I'm just trying to unravel because the world right now is full of judgment, is full of hate, is full of resentment. There is so much going on. People can't even walk down the street without being judged these yeah. days and yet you're working in a in a prison where there are – humans who have done bad things and you're withholding judgment like to me that is just an amazing skill set that is almost unheard of uh i think i think i think it doesn't matter what your job you're in and 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 in the role of being a prison officer you the only way for me as a human to be effective in that role was to not understand the why they were there, mm. but just to understand that they came from a point of equal, you know, from birth. I mean, I mean, uh, uh, and I don't mean equal. I mean, obviously, some people were born and, you know, put into adoption or, or what, whatever, whatever their story is. We are all equal as a human, as a in 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 a single form. Mm. We're all equal, and to judge a path, a decision that somebody somebody has made. You do that if you read into their why. Mm. And I didn't read into their why. I knew about Myra because she was so notorious. Yeah. You know, she was – but, you know, in in person she was just an old lady who was just institutionalised. She was never going to see daylight outside the prison ever she was never going home. She was a political prisoner. They were never going to let her go, rightly or wrongly. It was never going to happen, ever. I mean, I think she missed she missed the um, death penalty by weeks 
And she'd say all the time, you know, I, I wish I'd had it. Mm. I, wish, I wish I hadn't missed it. I wish, I wish I'd, you know, had the death penalty. I wish I'd been hung or whatever it was at the time. Um, I mean, but I was in my 20s. I was like, you know, I don't even know what she's saying. But in hindsight, you know, she lost her liberty and she deserved to lose her liberty. But we became a judge beyond her loss of liberty. You know, she was a political prisoner and she died in custody. Um, and it's not my job to say if that was right or wrong. But mm. there is a moral question to the way we conduct ourselves and the way we continue to judge outside of the courtroom, which I don't like. Mm. And I try and stop myself doing it. Of course, I have bias. I challenge myself and all the bloody time. It drives me nuts. Mm. When I came in today with you, your smart suit and me and me casual Friday, I'm like, really? Really? Yeah. <laughs> What's but, that all about? But that, I mean, that judgment was probably more on yourself, though. Went, but the which like is a one, <laughs> which is what we grapple with, and which is probably the most damaging, right? Because with judgment of self comes comparison, comes all the above. Do you? How do you apply yourself in your work environment in these days? Do you do you control the judgment? Do you see people for where they're where they're at? I mean, you you know, change management one hundred and one, right? It's understanding all the different perspectives of those in the room, or those who have a say, yeah. or even those who don't have a say. Do you, um, do you, does that come in good stead for you in, in today's environment? It's definitely got better with age. Yeah. So I I I am always struggled with always struggled and it's something I own it's not something anyone else's own owns but I but I always struggled with you know mixing in the c-suite space and having you know no no degrees mm. no university background you know it doesn't matter where I go I get asked all the time what's your background and I always say criminal justice and people always assume I've got a law degree mm. and I don't say anything else um I, you know I, I had a I had a, actually had a, a, a recent event where I went into state and I was talking to some CEOs of other companies and, you know, they were like, oh, what university did you go to? And, you know, I, and, and it's still now, I still now find that hard to answer. Mm. And I'm like, I didn't. Mm. And it, it's a conversation killer because people are like, mm, okay, that's strange. Um, and maybe that's why I try not to, or didn't judge prisoners. Mm. because it doesn't matter what your background is. It, act it actually doesn't matter. No. What's important is what you do now. I'm going to um, agree with you there because I'm the same. Good. I don't we love a, that. I don't have a degree. I've done – I started the MBA. I think I got my graduate certificate. Yep. But that was it. <laughs> like yep. I was like, nah, I'm not – I'm learning so much more in the job than what I've ever done. But, yeah, I was straight out of school onto a forklift – Yep. Um, lifting bags of cement to, to now where I am today and managing director of a business and I've learned but I've, I've spent a lot of money probably more so on myself than what people have in their degrees through yep. coaches, through yep. mentoring, through um, whatever have you, what, like online course, like I've just taught myself, picked up a book. So I struggle with the same question. Yep. People ask me what university I go to. I was like, yeah. Yeah, self, I think I think I'm they. Call, I think I don't know about you, but I, I, you know, the imposter syndrome. You know, I had my I had my um, year end review of my boss yesterday, and you know, and 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 it was still coming up. You know, it mm. still comes up, and I don't know if you ever ever lose that. And I think you know, even people who do go to uni have it. You know, because the snobbery about what uni and my daughter's now going through the. Do I go to University of Adelaide or do I go to Flinders? And and I listen to people advising her and they're talking about which one's the best. Yeah. There's a snobbery even in academia. It's just toxic. Yeah, it is. And none of it matters. No. None of it actually matters. It's just who <laughs> you are. Do you uh, do you buy into the infinite universe infinite universe theory? I have no idea what that is. Okay, so there's a there's a theory that there is an infinite amount of universes, each which uh, it, they each have a different result. So for Shakespeare, right, there's a he wrote Hamlet 
and he's got the full beautiful version of Hamlet, but there's another universe where there's one letter missing and there's another universe where there's two letters missing. Like it's just infinite, right? Yeah. Yep. And so there's this theory that at any point we could just dial into the one that we choose, right? That's called manifestation and there's like this is the one that we go. So there is a life where you can be a CEO of a business or a yep. managing director where you don't have a degree. Like that is a possibility. Yeah. There is no reason why it's not. And yep. you and I are just living in that universe, right? Yep. There are others. I believe that. Yeah. My ha- friends call it Parky Land. Yeah, Parky Land. She lives in a parallel universe. <laughs> yeah. I swear to God, yeah, that's, that's what right. they call it. But I, I, And you shift from lane to lane you, to absolutely. have the outcome that, for me, the outcome is what makes me happy. Yeah. Whatever it is. 100%. Whatever it is. But this is the, the whole point of, you know, there's this – stigma around the power of positive thinking and you know there's the secret there's all this stuff that go no you fact you can't just think that there's going to be a park car park and then you pull in and there's, yeah. a, there's a, like it doesn't work that way no. right you but but if you can think of a universe that you want to dial into then you just position everything in your life that goes to that direction i yeah. think that's the beauty of it yeah. and, and you and i have uh we've grown in our careers through um, like my 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 friendship group all went to university, yeah. all of them, and yeah. there's eight of us, and all of them went to university. I had already had four years of work experience before that even started working out in the in yeah. the real world. Yeah. So in my head, I'm like I'm in front of you. Like yeah. I've learned so much in these four years. Yeah. So not that mine I'm, all had babies. Yeah, well, you <laughs> just go. putting that out there. I wasn't the first. <laughs> I just think it's really in, in, interesting because you. You don't – education is absolutely important. Let's mm. not get there. But there are different ways in which one can I agree. learn. Yeah. I agree. Well, working in prisons is such a high-stake environment as well. What did, what did that teach you about um, the art of communication, the ability to diffuse conflict, all those sort of scenarios which we see in the office environment today? How is that – what did you learn in, in those? So the first year – the first year I learned a lot and probably probably the most profound thing in my first year wasn't Myra, interestingly. There was a young lady, um, she wasn't from the UK, um, tiny little slight lady. She would have been maybe four foot six, um, tiny. And, and I remember opening her cell door and at the time we didn't have in-cell um, sanitation, so it was buckets. Yep. And I'm um, opening her cell door and I'd got the meal trolley with me and she'd said to me, um, what's for dinner? And I'd said, fish. And she said to me, what kind of fish? And this is a young girl who had the p- day before potted, so thrown what the contents of her pot on the staff. So I responded in a really immature way and said, it's a fish with gills and a tail. <laughs> so I wore the pot. Yeah, well. And I remember shutting the door and thinking, mm, that's not how you communicate, Claire. Mm. You're being a smart ass and actually you're learning from people that you possibly shouldn't learn from on how to communicate with vulnerable people. Mm. So that was the biggest lesson I learned in my first year. Yeah. And I was like, you okay. You literally had people throw shit on you. I literally had a pot thrown at me and yeah. I deserved it, quite frankly. This, yeah. was, this was a young lady who was vulnerable who had lost her liberty and I was being a smart ass. And the last thing she needed when she was locked in her cell 23 hours a day was some smart ass who gets to ho- home every night and have a Chinese takeaway on a Friday night mm. telling her a fish has got towels and gills. Mm. So I learned pretty quickly that I was being a douche. Mm. And is that an Australian term? Yeah. That's because it is. Yeah. yeah, yeah, I'm becoming Aussie. Yeah. Um, <laughs> uh, I learned then that that was not how I behaved. Mm. And that was quite profound. I, I remember, I rem- can picture her vividly and I just hope she's alive still today, bless her, because I suspect possibly not, but that's a whole other yeah. story. Would she still be in prison? I suspect she's dead. Okay. Yeah, yeah, her life was pretty chaotic. Okay. Yeah, fingers crossed I'm wrong, right? Anyway, I then went, um, at the end of the first year, I said to my parents, right, I've got a mortgage, I've got a real job, I'm going to find a husband and I'm going to get married. So I'm going to go and work on the men's oh, side of the prison. So you've changed. Now you're going into what is... Now I'm, I'm going into the next level of yeah. grown-upness. Yeah. I'm changing my T-shirt. Yeah. So I went over to the men's side <laughs> level of, up. of the prison and I enjoyed working with male prisoners more than female prisoners. Um, 
much less complex needs, that less, much fewer primary carers, and it was quite close to home being a primary carer working with female prisoners. There's around 200 of them. Um, so it was quite close to home. I saw a lot of myself. Where in the men's side, I didn't see a lot of myself mm. because they were guys and they had different needs, right? So I went to work with the men and that was where I started to get my mojo. That was where I realised that the power of influence and communication um, to make a difference in somebody's life is profound and actually significant. And as a result of my interest in those areas, I decided I was going to become a hostage negotiator. And they sent me away to train um, the psychological training around hostage negotiation. Best thing I ever did. Yeah. Changed my world. I'm obsessed with that stuff. It changed yeah. my did world. You, did- can, can, can you teach us some of those things? Like, I'm like, because uh, Chris, do you know, have heard of Chris Voss? I don't know anybody. Oh, really? So, Chris Voss is like one of the most famous hostage negotiators. He's, well, written, he's, a, he's written a book called Can't ne- Be That Famous. No, well, he's written a book called I'm Never Split. <laughs> he's written a book called Never Split the Difference. It's literally one of my favorite sales books, but it's okay. on hostage negotiation. Wow, okay. Yeah. Anyway, keep I feel going. inadequate now. No, 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 I don't, don't know who Chris. Yeah, I know Chris. He came to the barbecue last Yeah, that's weekend. the one. Yeah, that's him. yeah, he's great. Brown hair. <laughs> yeah, that's the one. Yeah, yeah, that's him. I think, he's, I think he's got no hair now, though. Right? Bit, no, he's shorter, but it's a beard. Yeah, 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 he's still, yeah, yeah. That's him. That's him. <laughs> that's him. That's yeah. him. Um, um, so yeah, I did hostage negotiation. So um, pearls of wisdom from hostage yeah. negotiation: the minute you say yes or no, you are no longer negotiating. It's done. Really? Yes. <laughs> I just made you say yes. <laughs> it's over. The conversation's yeah. over next. So, so is, what, is the aim of the hostage negotiator to get them to say yes or no? Is that the, your... No, no. The aim of the negotiator is to keep people alive. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. My, my, my job is to de-escalate, defuse the risk. Mm. And when the perpetrator is ready, then it's the people that, the team that work behind the hostage negotiator. So, so if you imagine the scene, um, and, I, and, and I did a lot of hostage negotiation scenarios, a lot. Mm-hmm. So if you imagine the scene, we've got, whether it be a rooftop or a cell, um, largely um, rooftops, small than cells. So if we imagine we've got a cell and there's um, uh, two prisoners in the cell, one against their will, one perpetrator. So the hostage negotiator would go, and talk outside the cell to an area that had been cordoned off so that you're just talking to the negotiator. You're a human. You take off your epaulets. I would no longer have a rank or insignia. I would just be Claire. So I'd be talking to the negotiator. My job is to build a rapport with that individual and listen and and listen a lot more than I'm talking mm. because the more he's talking and he's going through the flight or it was he at the time, it could be a female, of yeah, course, yeah. but if this the same male prison. Yeah, yeah. Um, he's going through the fight, flight or flight or fight mode. Mm. Um, so he's going high and low and high and low. And my job is to just keep him talking while the team that are behind me, so when I say team, we we would mobilize a command suite, the same as the police would. We'd have like bronze, silver, gold command. And they would be working out what the plan is. So let's assume the hostage gets their throat cut. What are we going to do then? We'll mobilise people to go in and take them out and reduce harm and whatever else. What Are we going to allow Claire to carry on talking for 12 hours if he's calm? Are we just going to let this run? They, they, they do the strategy and the tactical. My job is to keep people alive and talking. Simple as that. Yeah. So I, I don't have the gift of yes or no. Yeah, do you? Because I don't have the power to authorize any of that. But do you get a say in the going in? You have like surely your gut feel on this conversation would be. What happens? What happens is there'll be there'll be like just say for argument's sake three hostage negotiators, right? There'll be one that's doing the talking. There'll be somebody that will be within earshot that will be taking the notes. Yeah, and then there'll be somebody who takes the notes from number two to the gold command suite. Yeah, okay. So what I'm doing is I'm furnishing their narrative. So I might I might have, for example, I'll give you an example. We had a, um, probably the one, probably the one that sits with me the most to this day. We had, um, it was Christmas, 
in the UK, cold, snowy, miserable. Mm -hmm. And um, we had a um, family member turn up to visit a young man. He would have been around 24. Um, and she'd brought him some cannabis in um, for Christmas. And he had some drug debts as well that he had to pay. So arguably his life depended on him having this cannabis, right? So to him, his story, it was a really big deal. We couldn't possibly understand that because we're not walking a mile in his shoes, right? So she's turned up. The dog, prison dog, has indicated on her and we found the drugs. So the visit was stopped. She was arrested. So this young man's sitting in the visit hall waiting to see his wife and kids, 20-whatever years old, thinking he's going to pay his debts, thinking he's going to get stoned and forget the pain of not being with his family at Christmas. Rightly or wrongly, that's his world. And then he realises quite quickly that actually she's not visiting. So he gets really angry because he knows she's been caught and he knows the consequences of her being bought means that he's caught, means his children will be in foster care at Christmas. So his levels of anxiety, he can't pay his debts, so his life's at risk. He can transfer to another prison, but he'll always be someone who doesn't pay his debts and it's a very small world. So he gets really angry, he's very young, and his emotional regulation is unable to be controlled. So he gets into a position where he's unable to do anything. So he goes on the roof, he climbs on the roof, and he just sits there, figuring out what the hell what the hell is he going to do next? He doesn't know. It's, it's a bit like me with the, having a baby at the 16. I, what else do you do? There's, no, there's nobody else providing you any solution. So he goes on the roof. It's a complete fight mode. So call the hostage negotiator gets called out because we can't send people up there to go and get him down. He's going to jump. There's going to be a fight. Maybe our staff will get hurt. Maybe he'll die. It's snowing. The roof is icy. It's dangerous. So they send in the negotiators and I was called on this, I think it was Christmas Eve, I was called. And I remember standing there like, and he was sat on the corner of the roof talking to me and he was pretty angry. Were you up there on the roof with him? Or no, 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 no. Yeah. He was on the roof. It would have been maybe uh, maybe 16 foot high. Okay, yeah. And so I was so just, three, I was just three. standing in a courtyard, yeah, okay. you know, just me, just me and him. Yeah. And we were talking and obviously he was angry and he was crying and, you know, he was ripping tiles off the roof and he wanted to throw them at anybody in a black and white uniform because it was our fault. That's his reality, right? It, we, we are, it was our fault, you know, and in his world. That's his perspective. Yeah. That's his perspective, right? In his world, he's right. And, and just because I think I'm right doesn't mean he's wrong. Um, so, yeah, um, me and him were talking for our hours. And all behind me, the prison staff were queuing up and they weren't allowed out the gate because this was happening at the gatehouse, which means if we open the gate and staff come past, you know, they're at risk of missiles being thrown from the roof. So they're at risk. So, of course, we've got this workforce who are not hostage negotiator trained. So just think, for God's sake, just go up there, use force, get him down. And they're heckling him. You know, so of course, every time someone walks past, they're like, I want to go home to my family, mate. Go down. That's their reality. Mm. They're not wrong either. And I'm Switzerland. Mm. My job is to just ignore them and keep him alive and stop them getting harmed if that's, if that's the outcome of what I'm doing with him. And it's not for them to understand my role. Anyway, I reckon it was probably four or five hours. Uh, we got let out late. We weren't allowed to go home that night. It was pretty ordinary for everybody, me included, and particularly for the young man, James, his name was, um, particularly for him. And we developed a bond, if you like. I knew his kids' names by the end of it. Um, you know, I hadn't committed anything to him because I couldn't. I wasn't in charge of how he was going to come off the roof. I just wanted him to come off the roof safely. Um, and it got to a point where it was getting dark and it was no longer safe for him to be up there. So they were mobilising a team to go up and get him on a cherry picker um, and hopefully that wasn't going to result in restraint. So I then had to share with him, the note came to me to say, we're going up, we're going to get him. And I was like, I've just spent four years telling him, we're not, four hours telling him we're not going to come and get him. Um, so of course then I'm like, <laughs> makes me look like a liar. I'm like, you know, the best thing we can do, change management 101, yeah. is provide transparent communications mm. so that he 
comes to the alignment with our storyboard. Mm. So I then had to reverse engineer her back and, and, and go back to him and say, okay, we're, we're coming up to get you, James. Now, there's two ways you can go with this. You can fight us and there's a huge risk to you. You know you're going to be moved to another prison. You know you're probably going to be recategorised because now you're a risk to us. You're probably going to go to a higher category prison. Now, you can have assault of a member of staff, which means you're going to do more time in custody. And you could jump off the roof and potentially kill yourself or be permanently disabled and your parents, your, your children don't have a father anymore. Or you can just go with them calmly and we'll put you in the segregation unit and I'll come and see you tomorrow. And he looked at me and he sat there and I was like, please go for the latter. And he, they went up on the roof and he did not take his eyes off me the whole time. They cuffed him and he was just looking at me and I was just miming to him and sticking my thumb up. And he came down, he got in the cherry picker and he looked at me and he mimed, I'm going to cry. <laughs> It's okay. He just said, thank you, Miss Parkinson. And that changed my life. Yeah. Oh. He was a human. Yes, he was a human. Yeah. That moment, uh, he's probably dead now too, but yeah. uh, it changed my life because... The people around me couldn't possibly understand what I was doing because they hadn't walked the path I'd walked. Mm. They couldn't possibly understand what he was doing, as nor could I, because I hadn't walked his path. But at that moment on that cherry picker, the change management had aligned mm. and we connected on a level that saved his life and changed mine forever. And that's change management. Mm. Mm? Yeah. When you say it changed yours forever, and in, in, in what what do you mean by that? I mean, it's it's a, such a powerful story and a powerful moment. Mm. What happened in your life from that point that was changed? Everyone was equal. Mm. Yeah, everyone's equal. Some of us have more money than others, but we all have a path, and we all take our own journeys and. You can never judge somebody else's journey unless you've walked it. And at different times in our lives, our orbits connect. And, you know, there's, I think you put something on LinkedIn the other day saying we're one decision away from something that will change our life forever. Yeah. And that was my one decision away. I watched it play out and I'd never seen it like that before. Yeah. I just hope he's okay. Mm. Mm. Thank yeah. you for sharing. Yeah. That's, uh, I've never cried telling that story uh, before. Never. But it was profound. Yeah. It was a profound moment. I was very proud. That was the moment I knew I was good at that job. You were? Yeah. You literally saved someone's life. Do you... Have you ever... Like, I'm referring to a lot of books here, but... Um, Man's Search for Meaning by Viktor Frankl is by far and away my favourite book and it's a, it's a story of a psychotherapist who went to Auschwitz like it was in World War II and with, with the gas chambers and all the above. And there's a part in the book and it just reminded me when you were talking then, a thought, little thought bubble went off into, in my head and there's a point in there where they were stripped of all their clothing and all their possessions um, as they went into the concentration camp, mm -hmm. and he wrote in his in this in the in his uh, in his book, and he said it was that point was the first ever realization that when everyone's standing there naked with nothing but their skin and no possessions to hold on, the only thing we have is this body, which makes us all equal, right? So yeah, it's just such a yeah, it's, such it's a, just what we do with it, right? Yeah. There's no price to kindness or um, respect, mm. but we lose it so often. Yeah, be kind always. You know. 
the these situations pop up a lot and I do want to sort of bring this into a learning perspective from a business environment because I, like the, the, I mean the story is such a an amazing story and you talk you talk change management throughout we are a business that works in change we work in complex change nothing like that right that hostage negotiation is is the most complex that you can get but as you traveled through your career and you and you saw these change moments pop up over and over again what's one thing from the the learning of the hostage from your experience that when dealing with a complex change, what is one thing that you always turn to? One thing that you will always hold as true when managing through change and dealing with complex people? Context. Mm. People, um, we, we, as humans, we're always time poor, particularly in the corporate environment. And we're really quick to send out an email, change a policy, you know, whatever it is that we do in our workplace, we go for the, you know, the least path of resistance and it's normally click send mm. or hold a town hall and say, oh, by the way, we're changing your work conditions, we've spoken to the unions and this is what we're doing. And then we wonder why six months down the line we've got people that are still not coming in on the new time roster. We've got people that are still still not following policy um, because we haven't provided the context. People haven't understood the why, the reason why we're doing it. So we haven't actually looked at what their reality is, mm. right? So when I, when I um, talked to James, I knew his reality. The people on the roof that went up to get him didn't know his reality. That wasn't his their job. Their job was to get him off the roof. Yeah. My job was to get him off the roof safely. Yeah. So I had to know the context. And without the context, he wouldn't have come off the roof safely. Mm. He'd have just seen people coming up, men coming up in black, you know, camouflage outfits with CS gas or whatever you call it here, pepper spray, capsicum spray. Yeah. He'd have been he'd have fought. But his for his reality, he needed to understand, it's Christmas Day, James. We've got to get you down. It's snowing. The snow's going to turn to ice. You're at risk. You've got options. These are your options. And then what you do is you build your tribe. You yeah. have your stakeholders. You have your champions around you who are going to communicate that message for you. Can't you, We're not on an island. You can't do it on your, on your own. So I think the... Where we go wrong with change is we don't understand the recipient's world and what their hotspots are. We don't seek to listen enough so that we can align where there's friction or hotspots. We don't do that well. We're not good at identifying who our stakeholder group is, who are the people that are going to guide this work and and get the message across so that they are able to provide context to and I think that's they're probably the two fundamentals around change that I think I see go wrong you know in all aspects of my life over my my career journey um listening is key if you don't listen and that's 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 why I'm eternally grateful to hostage negotiation because you listen and you can't say yes or no mm. which means you have to listen because you can't close out a conversation. Two ears and one mouth is the... Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Double the amount of listening. Dove and some, yeah. Yeah. Yep. I, um, I, love, I love what you've... The way you've just explained context and, and listening and how it all it comes into what is actually a really beautiful ecosystem when managing change. We, we work to a model which we call BCIP, um, and I'm happy to share this with anyone because it's, it's ready for anyone to use. <laughs> it's boundaries, context, impact, perspectives. So what are the boundaries? What's in? What's out? How are we managing this? Yep. What is the context? Yep. What's the impact that it has on everyone? Yep. The not going home for Christmas, the kids, the, yep. all the different scenarios. Yep. And then what are the perspectives? And, the, uh, and I want to add to the context point 
we use a model. Well, we just call it the street corner model. It's nothing like really out there. It's pretty straightforward, and I've spoken it about a few times on this on the podcast previously. But if you and I are standing at an intersection, and there is a car crash in the middle of the intersection, and we're on different corners, we see the exact same car crash but differently. 100%. None of us are right. Oh, sorry, none of us are wrong. We are both 100%. right. Hundred percent. And, and I think what I'm hearing in that, um, in, in, your, in your hostage negotiation with James on the roof is I am looking at his street corner perspective yep. and I'm trying to get him down off that roof. Yep. But everyone else, but whilst I'm doing that, I'm looking at the people who are not getting home to their families on Christmas Day. Yeah. I'm looking at my own context of I'm standing out in the bloody cold for four hours, yeah. right? So you can get impatient from that alone. So it is just such an amazing skill that you've learned and you've been able to obviously um, save someone's life in such a high-stake environment. So thank you for sharing that story. Mm, it's a pleasure. I feel privileged that I joined the prison service. Yeah. And they did that. They put you on that course. Changed my world. I use it every day. Mm. Mm. Not quite, you know, the in that, same. In that no, detail. Not really. It's not, yeah. But it, I, I do find myself using it every day. Yeah, we don't want people on any roofs. No roofs. I no. definitely don't want – I've had knives to throats. I've had poo thrown at me. And you name it. It's, yeah. It's been, it's been definitely well used. So you've m moved up the ranks, you've gone into leadership roles. Yes. And then you've moved, to, you've been poached or you've been headhunted and, yes. and, and wanted to come over here into Australia yeah, and start so up I, a life. So I had a, like, um, it was, it, you had to wait five years before you were able to sit the supervisor exam. It was just kind of the way it was. I don't think it's like that now, but it was then. Um, so I had to wait. Four years till I could sit the exam and then another year until I could sit the second part of the exam. And, of course, I passed, um, which I was never bloody going to fail, oh, let yeah. me tell you. I just would never have forgiven myself. So I became a supervisor. And then from, from that point on, there was no restrictions other than, um, um, you know, I obviously had to apply for a job and I had to um, sit a couple of – to become, you know, certain – command level and not no longer be a hostage negotiator and then move to the command suite I had to sit certain exams and stuff but it was quite meteoric from that point on so once the five rise five um years had passed you know I got my principal officer within the year then I became a prison governor within the year and I moved around quite a lot um because generally um certainly was in those days generally when you got promoted you moved you moved to a different establishment. So I moved house quite a bit, which was great for me because my first house, the £23,000, um, was getting better. Mm. Every time I moved, I got a better home. Yeah. So my son had a better life. It moved him to a different socioeconomic world and my life was shifting. I was shifting the dial on where I'd come from, not that I'm not proud of it because I, I very yeah. am proud of it. But I was shifting the dial. My life was changing. You were choosing a new universe for yourself. I was, yeah, I was moving in a different orbit. Um, and I loved my job. I mean, it was the best job on the planet. I was happy. It got me out of bed every day. I loved it. And I moved into London and, and I got head of operations, which was a massive, just a chief of staff type role. They called it head of operations. That's the first time they moved it into that space. But um, the guy I worked for was a tremendous human being. And um, we had the 10 London prisons. Um, we were in the middle of privatising, um, you know, uh, we'd hit the GFC. So the world as we knew it in the public sector had fundamentally shifted. We were off the back of, you know, um, the 7-7 seven, seven bombings, you know, terrorism was becoming homegrown. We were having radicalisation in our prisons. So everything from a change management perspective in the, in the um, socioeconomic, you know, we were in this micro... Um, cosm of society and our society had shifted hugely so there was no chance on any any level I was ever going to get bored change was every single minute of every single day I didn't know what I was going to get and I bloody loved it it was awesome um, and I was in London for about three years in this role which was a stretch role for me there's no question um, I lived in Oxfordshire at the time I was commuting four hours a day 
Um, I had a six-month-old baby when I first went back into that role. So I literally was dropping her off. I was getting the 5 a.m. train um, into London and I was getting home at 7 p.m. So she was in full-time childcare. Yeah, what's her name? Abby May. Abby May. So somebody else saw her walk for the first time. You know, somebody else, you know, I missed all of that stuff. Um, although they were very polite about it and they hmm. said that she hadn't, well, I know she did. Yeah. She got her first steps in nursery. and But that was, the, that was the sacrifice I made so that she had a better life than my son had and, the, you know, I shifted her universe um, to something better than I'd had. Yeah. You know, that was my gift, yeah. but that it didn't come without a cost, of course. Yeah. Um, and then I moved to, um, I got offered a promotion about three years into the London gig and um, I went up and managed one of their private prisons on behalf of Ministry of Justice, um, big, big contractor. And, and that, was, that was a new stream of work for me. It, was, it took me into the commercial world. I'd only ever been public server. So I was a service. I was only ever um, not for profit, arguably. I'd gone into a world where it was a 9% profit, you know, minimum um, which which compromised me a little bit because yeah. I was like, well, hang on a minute, how are we making profit out of prisoners? But of course, you know, that was just because it was new to me. I, I now understand it. it doesn't mean the level of service is better or worse. It's just what it is. It's just a commercial model of caring for people, which of course we have here in our in our aged care communities. So it's it was just new to me. Yeah. Um, and then I got a call out the blue about would you consider coming to Australia? And I was like, hmm. mm. someone in the lounge said to the hubby, some random dude just messaged me. I, I reckon he might be a wrong un. And he, and he said to me, well, how about you Google him? I'm like, yeah, sure. So I Googled him. And I go back, I went, oh, my God, he's the CEO. He said, and? I said, oh, what do you reckon? Should we go to Australia? He went, yeah, let's do it. And then two, two weeks later, I was in Singapore having a job interview. And, and while I was there, they offered me the job. And I, I rang up the hubby and said, right, there's two envelopes on top of the microwave in the kitchen. The first envelope is your resignation and the second envelope is mine. Can you post them? I'll be home in a couple of days. And I could hear him physically shaking and he said, oh, you know, Parkinson, <laughs> you're mad. I went, yeah, I know, but we're going to get sunshine. We're going to get sunshine in our lives. And we literally, I reckon it was, um, it would have been about nine weeks later I'd sold my house. I'd quit my job, my job of 15 years. Right? Yeah. I loved my job, but I always knew I could go back. So you're just all in. So we just rocked up with three suitcases. I didn't know anybody, anybody. We got off the plane and I cried for about three days. I was like, the right bean is $7. There's no pork sausages. I can't find an Indian restaurant. I was just, I was broken. He was, he loved it. He landed and he went, I'm an, I'm an Australian. But me, I was like, oh my God, you know, everything I thought. Thought I knew and loved. What year was this again? It was 2011. We landed yeah. New Year's Eve, yeah. 2011. And, uh, yeah, it took me a long time, a long time to come to terms with everything was different. Mm. I just assumed because you all spoke English, like, no, and it was the same. And we're all convicts, right? Like. I, 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 didn't, I didn't even know about that. I hadn't oh, did you? All I knew was it was sunshiny, although, yeah. although when you look at the last few weeks, I think I need a refund. <laughs> Um, That's true. Yeah, but like I had no idea. I had not anticipated the level of personal change mm. and the impact of that change on me. And the reason I had no context. Mm. It was just, it was just Claire's. Yeah, I can do that. Mm. I can do that. I hadn't researched. I hadn't. I hadn't done you my. Just did. I just spur did it. of the moment decision. It was a spur of the moment. Generally, the best decisions are made. Well, they were. The well, it is in hindsight. Yeah. I mean, I love it. I'm, I'm Australian. That's it for me. Yeah. Um, but in hindsight, um, that there was a missing piece in my life that took me two years to reverse back and fill the change management around it from Claire's perspective. Claire didn't do good at. Yeah. She didn't do good. You she learned the hard way. She had a death of a thousand cuts in yeah. terms of grieving. Well, I mean, this is look. Okay, so we, this is what I'm hearing here is we work in change, right? And so we get called in so many times after the fact that we have to then go back to the start and figure out. So this is exactly, exactly what exactly what yeah. happened. Yeah. It took two years for me to figure that out <laughs> that I'd done it all wrong. So, I'd done it all wrong. So Liam 
came with a No, whole, he no? didn't. No, no, no. no. He, he um, partner, child, well, first child, yeah. um, mortgage. He, you know, so works stay, in uh, Oxfordshire. He's still there? He's still there yeah. and he loves it. Yeah. And, you know, despite my best endeavours, yeah. uh, he's a way off coming to Australia. Yeah, okay. yeah I think, yeah. He, he's living the dream. He loves it there. Very good. Yeah. We'll get him here one day. I think so. Yeah. I think so. His, his children are still little. Just um, go outside. It's 30 degrees outside well, today. Well, I know, right? Not yesterday. Oh, no, yeah. the day before yesterday. I, would, yeah. he, would, he, I wouldn't <laughs> have been able to sell it, right? No, no, he's still there. My daughter's here, obviously, but... So you started where? In Australia. What was your first job? It was in the justice system still? Yes. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I ran Mobilong Prison. Yes. Very yes. good. Yes. I came over. It was like... It was like... Um, it's only small. It's like 320 prisoners. Yeah. So we had like, just for context, I think in, in South Australia, we have around 2,100 prisoners. Mm -hmm. I don't know if that's still the number, but it was around that. You know, in London, where I had the 10 prisons, we had 33,000. Yeah, it's unbelievable. So just, you know, so so it was, it was, it was small. Mm. Yeah, you put your feet up. <laughs> well, I, I, I definitely didn't put my feet up because there was a lot, lot that, you know, needed to change. But, um... It was a it was the culture piece for me that um, I had some shifting to do. Yeah, I hadn't anticipated, as I said, that you know we're, we're two different countries. I mean, obviously, I knew that, but I had not anticipated the difference. So, what so you, I had to grow up. Yeah, so, again. So cultural meaning from a nationality standpoint, not from a... Your prisoners are so nice. Yeah. <laughs> what the hell? Yeah. I could not believe it, you know. Yeah. They would be like, morning, miss. <laughs> I'm like, what? <laughs> Who are you? We just, just so Australian and so bloody nice. I just had, I'd come from the back of the GFC, the back of 9-11, the back of 7-7, you know, homegrown, Terrorists, yeah, radicalization in our prisons, violence to the level I couldn't imagine that had come in from it, some of our Eastern European gangs, and I come to Mobile Long Prison. I was like, "Whoa, yeah. like whoa!" So it, I, I had to. Grow these people up. wouldn't even make prison in. Oh, <laughs> they wouldn't. They would. They'd be coming to mine for a barbecue. They're generally good humans. Um, we've so, had we've had Grant Stevens on the show, the yeah. police commissioner of yeah. South Australia, and he said similar that we've got a very nice state. Yeah, we have. Yeah. It's quite beautiful. Mm. So I was like, what the actual? <laughs> like, how is this possible? Um, I couldn't believe I'd go to work in the morning and I'd drive all the way up to Murray Bridge and the radio would tell me how many people had died on our roads in the last 12 months. And I was like, whoa, I am in such a safe community. You know, we only talk about how many people have been stabbed to death in this particular postcode in the last day yeah you know i was just like this i, I knew i'd made the decision yeah. that my child she was four at the time um we, we when when i got the cold call um we were going through this horrible period in the uk which was just indiscriminate violence yeah. um there were riots everywhere i can't remember i think it was I, I, it was off the back of a, a, a shooting of a, a black youth. I think it was in America. I might have got that wrong. Um, but there had been these youth riots that were just burning down residential properties just because it was just – I think we had like thousands of – maybe 8,000 people come in custody overnight yeah. as a result. I mean, it just – and I remember going home and saying, she's four. I think it's time to go. And, and we come here and I'm like, we did the right thing. Yeah. We did the right thing. She's safe. Gabrielle is from Brazil. Yeah, and well. We, and we were talking. I mean, England's nothing on Brazil. You, yeah. guys, you guys have it much harder, but yeah, you understand. We were actually talking about yesterday, there's parts of Brazil in which they don't even slow down at the stoplights. 100%. Yeah. 100%. And we, we, we are very lucky. Like it's, it's, I've only ever lived in Australia. And, in fact, I'm probably I'm not well-travelled at all. I haven't been. It's a beautiful place. Yeah. It's beautiful. Yeah, very lucky. Oh, we make our own luck. Yeah, that's yeah. right. It's beautiful. Yeah. I want to talk about, I mean, we, I'm, I'm conscious of your time because we're uh, – we, we could talk we, all day, we right? Could, we could literally talk all day. I feel like I want to, but I um, <laughs> we, we, we got to make sure that we keep with some sort of time. But 
Why you... do you say that to all the girls, right? <laughs> Just keep them keep, true to me and keep them... <laughs> 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 yeah, that's right. Get kicked me out. Time's up. Go. <laughs> um, I, um, I, I, I really, I, I've got so many questions and I haven't even... I don't think we've even touched the surface of what these half the questions that I've got written down, which is just a testament to you and your story. But I want to touch just a little bit more on the change aspect. Mm -hmm. And we we spoke previously um, around your learnings and experiences through the justice system. And before we move on to your next phase of life, I want to we spoke briefly yesterday around the macro change that significantly shifted uh, the way the workforce people mm -hmm. did their job and you gave me a 9-11 example. Can you dive into that for us, please? So a macro change that significantly changed the way people in the workforce did their job. Yeah. So um, so if we were to take from an obviously 9-11, shocked the world, the world stood still. Yep. It changed the face of what we – it's a bit, a bit like saying, you know, some of us have crimes that we consider acceptable, like – and there are crimes where, you know, it's the same in prison, right? If you're, if you're a sex offender, you generally have to go to a prison where you're protected because other criminals don't tolerate that kind of behaviour. Yeah. We in you're society the do the, the same. You, yeah. Then we had – 9-11 happened and we all sat on in just shock and saw the planes fly into the World Trade Centre. And as a result of that, that shifted the paradigm of who we have in prison. Now, if you imagine the scene, we have a large cohort of people that have lost their liberty, right? They are locked up for many hours a day, some 23, some more than 23 hours a day, not, not necessarily in in our England prisons, but some places in the world, they probably don't get out their cell very much at all, if at all. Um, so we've got a collective audience. We've got people in our prisons who are vulnerable and looking for their tribe. They're looking for their community. They've never fit in any kind of gang. They've never been part of a functional family. And we have this world-stopping event that has made everybody pay attention. So we have our radicalisation opportunity in prisons for people that are there to take advantage of vulnerable people and recruit people who are happy to slit the throat of a prison officer, to take a hostage, to put a bomb in their shoes, to strap a bomb round their waist, to kill a child, to drive a truck into a group of school children. Whatever it is, we have this captive audience. So straight away, we've got a whole new dynamic to how we do our work. Now, don't get me wrong. We've always had terrorism and terrorism isn't linked to just one religion or faith. It comes in all shapes and sizes, disaffected people, whether it be gangs that are operating in a way that they class shooting as gangland activity when actually it's an act of terrorism, mm. whether it be Ireland and the IRA, what it, whatever the religious belief is, we also have a system that largely world over isn't a political seat winner. So when there's an election, the police always get the money. Prisons never get the money. So what we do is we put more police on the streets to keep our streets safe. But what we do is we put more people in prison. Mm. So we rack them and stack them, which means our resources get thinner. So our ability to see all this stuff happening is getting weaker and weaker and we don't provide enough religious services to represent all of the faiths. We normally just stick to the Christianity and the ones that are what we consider very, very white community yeah. because that's what we've always done. So we've got this group of very young, very vulnerable people that – have now got something to aspire to because they just want to be part of a community. So oh, literally overnight, literally overnight, we had to change the way we communicate, not only change the way we communicate with the prisoners, but change the way we communicate about the prisoners. So everything became top secret. You know, we had 
high net worth terrorism activities happening in the UK and around the world, hugely funded. So we could no longer communicate by traditional methods. We'd have to use secret squirrel stuff and super cross-threading stuff because they'd find out who our grasses are. So we'd have covert human intelligence sources who'd tell us, you know, this lawyer is a terrorist and they are funding and aiding and abetting terrorism. So everything, everything changed overnight from the safety of our people, the way our prisoners played and the way they operated the way we communicated, the way the world saw us, but yet nothing changed. We had no extra money. We had no different training because we, it was new. There was no, there was no scientific evidence that was shaping the way we were delivering our work. So we had to rapidly evolve is probably the, the biggest shift. You haven't experienced that to the same level in Australia, no. thankfully. Um, doesn't mean you won't. No. Um, right. and, and you're aware and, I, and uh, you know, you guys are, are doing work in that space that is relevant to your jurisdiction, but it was full on. It was really full on. Yeah, I grew up again then. How I'm 903. <laughs> How do you compartmentalise in a world like that? How do you go home to your daughter? It's not personal. It's not personal. It's like... Um, I don't know. I get. I have been asked that a lot, actually. Um, I used to sit in sex offender treatment program works and have heard things that, you know, I try and laugh about it, um, not, you know, I, I try and make humour out of it, you know, mm. particularly some stories involving some animals, like, you know, because <laughs> you, you kind of have to. You yeah. kind of have to. I, obviously, I can't make light of some of the stuff I've heard, but um, I don't know. I don't know. How do you, how do you compartmentalise it? You, you take... You take from it the things that you can make humorous mm. and the things that are so dark, you just don't go into the depth that – you just don't go into the depth that's going to harm you. And, you know, we had like – you'd get like critical incident debriefing, so you'd have psychological debriefs so you could take it off your back yeah. and say, you know, today was really hard. You know, I saw someone had their throat cut. It was a bit too much for me today. And you'd have that briefing, you know, a bit like if you do family liaison roles, you know, and you have to go and tell people that, you know, their loved ones died or whatever it is. You just you just have the debrief and then you just let it go. Occasionally I'll think back, you know, sometimes I'll, on anniversaries and stuff, I'll think about some of the messages I've had to convey to loved ones when they've lost people, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll sometimes, if it's on a, like a milestone day, like a Christmas day or something, I'll think, well, now they're going. But it's fleeting. Yeah. Because it has to be. It has to be. I, and I don't know how I do that. I don't, I don't, I have to survive. So there is no option for me. Yeah. I have to. Do you, like, you've seen, like, that, that macro change, no doubt you just saw a series of events that just played out in ways that probably, like you said, you grew up again and your life changed yet again. Do you, do you look at change in organisations now and people's reactions and privilege and just shake your head and go, you have no idea <laughs> around what is happening or is, it, is that not the right context? I, I, I don't know. I, I mean... You know, my 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 daughter. I was I was chatting away to my daughter the other day, and um, I was like, oh, you know, uh, poor me, blah, blah, yeah. blah. and she said, I'll oh, listen to you, you Karen. <laughs> she said, you white privileged woman who haven't got a gardener anymore, <laughs> and it just put it put it right back home. And yeah. I was like, oh my god, listen to me, listen yeah. to me. But my problems are my own, and they're real to mm. me, the same as everybody else. So I don't think I don't. One one we're affecting change. Whether it doesn't matter what the business is or who the individual is, their story is their story, and they're going through their grief journey and they own it. And it's not any more or any less than the person who lives on the street or the person that was in prison and lost their liberty. It's just different. But in their world, it's all that matters. And as long as you accept that every single one of them is unique 
and no one of them is better or worse than the other, it makes it easier. Mm. I, it, it, I never kind of look and, you know, and actually sometimes if I get really nervous, um, which I do, if, if I've got to publicly speak or something, and, I, and I'll kind of like, I'll do myself a little pep talk when I walk on and I always say, Claire, are you going to get covered in shit? <laughs> is someone going to throw a shit parcel at you? Yeah. Or are you going to get spat at? Or are you going to get stabbed with a pencil? Or are you going to get taken hostage? No, you're not, you silly girl. Pull up your big girl pants. Yeah. Get on the stage and rock it and then throw up in the toilet afterwards. <laughs> it's all good. It's all good. So, but that's my context. Yeah. And it would be wrong of me to apply that same to other people because theirs would be very different. You know, their yeah. anxiety would be real in their way. Correct. And I wouldn't understand it. I wouldn't understand it because I haven't walked it. No. Yeah. And <clears throat> understanding everyone's context and, and levels of, of like, like I, I, everyone asks me, you know, were you scared? Were you concerned when you went out and started your own business and you walked away from a well paid job and <coughs> excuse me. Um, and my thought process at the time, which is from a very privileged point of view of what is the worst that can happen. Mm -hmm. I lose everything and move back in with my mum and dad who live it down at Grange. <laughs> Grange Beach, right? That sounds horrible. That sounds horrible. My goodness. Do you know what I mean? Like yeah. I, and that was kind of the thing. It's like well, I have no choice now oh. but to do because if that is the worst case scenario, then I am still in the top 1% in the world, right, from a, from a being in a privileged yeah. and lucky position. So, yeah, um, yeah context is, is, is definitely everything. We can't talk about this. Uh, we can't go through this pod co conversation without talking about Oz Minerals. And how you ended up in an executive role there. Andrew Cole has been uh, touted as a visionary and, you know, a, like an amazing CEO. I've met him a couple of times, always great things. Um, I'm really interested in how you ended up there. I do know the story and I know it's an amazing story. Can you share with us um, how you ended up in your role at Oz? Yes, I can. Um, so way back when... 2015, um, I hadn't long left government. I had had a little bit of a dabble in the commercial world, at, you know, set up my own company and tried to do the consulting thing and always wanted to get in mining. One, you know, when I think about working in Australia, when I was in the UK, I'd think mining, but I was like, I'm never going to get in mining. I'm not an engineer. I don't know anybody. Anyway, long story short, um, I remember reading another uh, newspaper article and another one of those defining moments. Yeah. It wasn't the Daily Mail. I think it was Advertiser. <laughs> And I remember reading an article about this mining company called Oz Minerals that had moved its office from Melbourne to be based in Adelaide. And I remember reading this story about this new young CEO, I want to say young, same age as me, so he's really young. Yeah. <laughs> um, and I remember reading this story about this person thinking he sounds like a great human. So I did a bit of stalking on LinkedIn, as we all know, and as uh, people listening all know, we all do it. Who's viewed you? Who yeah, hasn't? Yeah. He hadn't viewed me, but I had absolutely stalked him yeah. and said, I think we need to meet for a coffee. You need to know me. Um, and Andrew being I did Andrew, that to you, didn't I? I don't – probably, yeah. I, I, I kind of like that. Yeah. You know, who doesn't like that, yeah, right? I did that Who to doesn't you. like that unless Correct. you get 600 a day and then yeah. it's not so cool, but yeah. I don't, so keep well, them did, coming. Well, I think the idea is don't try to sell anyone anything. Yeah, yeah, well, 100% or yeah. add you and then send you a great big cut and paste. Correct. Like, stop with yeah. that shit. Yeah. Anyway, <laughs> so I messaged him and said, you need to I, – I don't remember the exact words. It would have been Claire words. Um, you know, it probably would have involved Indian curry or something or other about <laughs> what I was doing on a Friday night. Anyway, I messaged him and said, we need to meet for a coffee. And to my surprise, he said yes. So I was like, okay, I have no idea what I'm going to say to him. None whatsoever. So I went along and just kind of sat there and tried to, you know, play it cool, like, you know, ex-government, ex-prisons, like, you know, how, how do I translate, how do I translate my whole working life into something that's going to be useful to him? And I couldn't, quite frankly. But Andrew being Andrew, he saw that I had – I wanted to invest in his company. I wanted to invest whatever it was that I had or whatever my worth professionally was in his company. And um, after me harassing him for quite a few months, he said, okay, I'll send you out to Prominent Hill. Um, the only brief you have is go out there for the day and then report back to me what you see. I was like, right. 
So I was like, right, here's my one chance. It's essentially a job interview, right? So I go out to Prominent Hill. I didn't know anybody. I'd never been to a mine site. I was just blown away. As my camera was, you know, I was like, oh, my God, look at that. Look at that. It's massive. Oh. <laughs> anyway, so I was only there for a few hours by the time I'd got the flight back the same day. And I thought, right, okay, I'd got my scribble notes. You know, I, I, I knew how to talk to people. So I knew that that was the only way, because I wasn't an engineer, the only way I was going to find out the dirt, literally. So I wrote all my notes down and got back and thought, shit, I've got to make this look good. I've got to do something on a page because I've got one more chance. I've got to get in front of him and I've got to blow him away, right, with this non-technical, non-mining background, one-pager so I got this one pager done and it was really, really cool. I've still got it on my phone. It's like, I love it. Guys. So I've done, I done, I done this thing. I done this thing and I called it the opportunity roadmap. Yeah, right? Great. And what I did was an opportunity to improve the business through people empowerment. Mm. And I did it all on a page. It was pretty pretty, pretty pretty and pretty specky. Anyway, I met with him and I just got it printed out on A3, a shiny, glossy paper, and I just sat there and I just passed it across the table and he just sat there and he, he didn't say a word. And I was like, far out, <laughs> I've blown it. <laughs> and I said, y you've got nothing to say? You know, I was kind of like, what? Come on, mate. And he was like, <laughs> Put a he's, bit like of time into this. he's like, to be perfectly honest, I'm a bit blown away with what you've observed in four hours. I was like, yeah? He went, Yeah. He said, I, I don't know what to say. I was like, well, just say I'm going to give you a job. And he just went, I'll get back to you. I was like, Fuck. <laughs> like this is like the second time. Yeah. And then the next time I heard from him, he said, we're having an off-site. How long, ago, how long after? Oh, maybe a month. Okay. So pretty. He so said, we're having an executive off-site. He said, I'd like you to come along and join us for the day. And I was like, great, great. I'll go. Didn't know anyone apart from, didn't really know him, right? I just stalked him for a bit. Didn't really know him, so I went along to the executive day. And when I got there, enrolled, um, you know, some of the big four consulting firms presenting how they would deliver innovation, right? So there's lots of pitches happening, lots of people I didn't know, important people, I don't yeah. know, just coming in, coming bit, in, coming boring. in. Well, mm, yeah. well <laughs> probably, probably, really. Um, and I just sat there observing it, thinking this is fun, but I have no idea. And then at the end of it, um, he says, okay, Claire, how would you deliver innovation at Oz Minerals and I was like fuck I don't know <laughs> I don't know so anyway I stood up and I thought you know what I can talk in front of a group of strangers right yeah. I, and 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 essentially innovation in my in my world isn't about you know the new the latest iPhone or the latest underground automated machine whilst that plays a part of it it's about the people that design it it's about the people that think it you know it's 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 about the people so I thought okay I'll just do what I what I know, which is how to innovate through people. So I did a, I did a, did a people pitch. Yeah. Can um, you give us a little bit of that pitch now? It was about listening to improve, actually. Yeah, okay. Um, it was about um, a, a, bi a big uh, organisational change program that I'd left uh, led for the southeast of England when I was on maternity leave because I couldn't go into prisons because I was, you yeah. know, a big wading whale waddling around. It yeah. was not so much the prisoners, it was more for my safety because yeah, yeah. I was huge. <laughs> um, and um, uh, as 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 part of that process, I'd gone to Bulgaria. They sent me to Bulgaria to do reform in the Bulgarian yeah. prison system, which yeah. is about incentive and earned privileges scheme, so basically being a human to prisoners. And... Um, I brought that work back and we'd got this thing called Listen to Improve, which is basically um, business planning through people motivation. Yeah. So what people want to improve our performance. Um, so I basically reiterated the work we'd done in the southeast of England, which was uh, around 10,000 people and had shifted the dial on on how we rate our prisons in term, you know, the, the inspector of prisons had rated us at various levels. We had this thing called Investors in People, which was an in independent body that would come in and say how good we were to our people. And this program aims to raise our level of accreditation in Investors in People, and we got it in the southeast of England, which we'd never done before. Um, so I thought, you know what? This stuff works. Treating people properly works and as a result of people coming to work and getting joy out of what they do we get better at what we do mm. and the outcomes speak for themselves so i basically did that pitch um but it was pretty it was pretty basic to yeah. be fair i was pretty rubbish i think i was, well, it was rubbish. unprepared 
totally unprepared. Yeah. Although Andrew so, now, Andrew would argue yeah. that I was prepared. Yeah. Maybe I was, I just didn't yeah. listen. You could turn um, it into a keynote now. Really yeah, I, I, was, I, I obviously wasn't paying attention. <laughs> um, you know, he's he's a fabulous human. Um, and, then, and then what happened was he said, okay, do you want to come and be our head of innovation? And I was like, sure. And I did. And then I was there a couple of weeks and um, – head of corporate affairs role come up. And I remember sitting there saying to him, oh, I don't really know much about investor relations, but I know about I know about public relations and I know about media because, you know, I was on the UK's London media circuit because of what the role I had. Yeah, yeah. Um, I was like, I think I could do that job. He's like, okay, let's give it a go. And then we had 12 days in South Australia of no power. And I was like, really? 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 Who wants to be head of corporate affairs for an ASX company when you have no power for 12 days? Yeah, wow. So it was another learning curve in my life. And um, Osmond was is a very special place, a very special place where I have grown, I have learned, um, and I love what I do. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that's amazing. Yeah. And he is a visionary. He saw something in me that I didn't see in myself and he backed he backed this horse. Yeah. I think mean, like your background, your experience, your learnings, the various and such like there's not like the standard deviation of the type of work you've done is yeah. so far and wide like it's I'm a generalist yeah, and proud of it. It's amazing and you should be very proud. Now we're almost approaching the two-hour mark, and we—I've got two, pa- two pa- pages left of questions. Oh my goodness! Where, I'm so sorry. Where, where did, no, that, don't be sorry. It's been. Well, you can uh, always get me back. Yeah, hundred percent. There's going to have to be around two. So well, I am going to start thinking about the wrapping up of of the podcast now. But I do want to just ask you a couple of questions, probably on a personal note of, of about Claire. Okay. What are you bad at? Trust in my um, intuition. Mm. Yeah. I, I don't make decisions fast in some aspects of my life. Yeah. I, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a saver. So um, I, 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 I show my love by service mm. and that sometimes takes a lot of my life um, when it's actually something I should probably walk away from. Yeah. So... But your, but your intuition played out really well when you're dealing with James on the rooftop, though. Yes, professionally, I've got it nailed. Okay. Yeah, on my in, in my personal life, it's I've had a colourful life. Yeah. yeah, I've had a colourful life, and I think that's probably why I am so. You know, my professional life is one of my children, and and I, I'm. Probably, I probably lean towards working way too many hours yeah. and always have because it's easier than holding the mirror up to oneself. Yeah. Do you not like what you see in the mirror or is it like... Well, it, as I'm getting older, I don't. <laughs> like on a Friday, I don't. Sometimes on a Tuesday, I look yeah, okay. It depends how, how many days before I've washed and straightened the hair. Now, context was needed in that question. Do yeah. you... Do you um, when you talk – when you say I treat my work life as one of my babies. Yes. It tells me that you – like, and I'm a parent and all parents would put more care into their children than themselves, right? Yeah, 100%. But we need to learn to put the mask on ourselves first in the context of an aeroplane, right, where the, the masks come down and we, we put ourselves first. Is that your biggest struggle? And yes. Does that affect you from a mental health perspective or do you have that covered? Oh, I'm mad as a box of frogs. Yeah. <laughs> no, <laughs> no, I'm not. No, I'm not. Uh, no, thankfully, uh, thankfully, I think my mental health has always been pretty sound. Yeah. Maybe it's not. Maybe there's some psychiatrists that are listening going, <laughs> she is mad. Um, I think, you know, my my – my struggle has always been, and it's things that you carry from 
events in your childhood, right? So I struggle with um, knowing my worth. I, I, you know, there isn't a day go by where someone doesn't say, know your worth, you know, back yourself, mm. Claire Parkinson, yeah. you know. And when, when I came in here and you said, oh, this is Claire Parkinson from Os Osmond Earls, I was like, no, 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 no. Osmond Earls doesn't define me. Yeah, correct. Parkinson defines me, yeah. you know. Um, that's just a facade, mm. you know. The truth, the truth is, you know, the whole worth, you know. So when I look in the mirror, what do I see? You know, I see somebody who's just – figuring out what she wants to do when she grows up. Mm. And I don't know if my personality type is I will always be looking, always be looking for, you know, the adventure, the what's going to keep me motivated, what's going to keep me awake at night. Um, but as I get older, I'm like, geez, I'd like some peace. You know, mm. I'd just like some peace in my world. Yeah. Um, Slowing down helps with the peace, doesn't it? I don't know. I don't seem to be doing any of that yeah. time anytime soon. I think I need to move into a house without a bloody big garden that has snakes in it. Maybe <laughs> that would help. So if happiness was a concoction. Yes. And, you know, different ingredients, ver varying volumes. Yep. What behaviours do you see as making the best recipe? Behaviors, active listening, mm -hmm. listening to hear, definitely. Laughter, is laughter a behavior? No, but what people give it to yeah. make you laugh is, yeah, um, yeah, it's the openness to the be able openness, to, yeah. yeah. Um, Togetherness, like surrounding yourself with people who are peaceful. And when I say peaceful, that doesn't mean not having extroverts in your life who yabber like I do, but just are together and peaceful and good harmony. Mm. That's it. That's it. I think that's it. It really is. Yeah. It's, it's funny. I like asking that question because it always just comes back to people. It doesn't matter. And money, it like, it, none of that matters. I well, think we can't take it with us. You can't, yeah. There's no, I, I go to, <laughs> there's a butcher down the road from me. I can't believe he's getting a mention because he's a bit of a twat. But he, um, oh my God, he's going to know <laughs> who you're talking no, about. He won't, he won't listen to this. He doesn't know I even exist. But the, um, he said something once that's absolutely stuck with me. He goes, mate, there's no trailer on the back of the hearse. And I just went, it's brilliant. It's, yeah, it's brilliant. True. Yeah, like, it you, is very You've got to just enjoy yeah. what you've got with what you've got. Yeah. And you're not going to lay on your deathbed. You know, I always say, if I get hit by a car, I'm not going to lay there and go, oh, my jeans are a bit tight. I wish I hadn't had that cake. <laughs> yeah, you know, right. you're not going to lay there and do that stuff, right? No. It doesn't mean I'm going to stop yeah. dieting or running. It's and about the, the, the things that you didn't say or the things that you did say. I'd rather people. regret something I have said yeah. than something I haven't. Yeah, correct. And, and, and I, you know, back, back to your point about, you know, the things that, you know, I, I, I would change, you know, I'd probably have said those things earlier. Because time waits for no one, mm. no one. And if we made the decisions earlier, then I wouldn't be 51, mm. you know, grumbling on about, oh, I wish I'd done that. Yeah. I wish I'd done that. But yeah. professionally, wouldn't change a thing. Wouldn't change a thing. That's been one thing I wouldn't change. And my children, of course. Yeah, no doubt. Right, we're going to move into quick fire questions. I reckon yes. we've just ticked over the two hour mark, which is uh, an epic conversation. So, what are you reading right now? So, um, my ex gave me a book as a parting gift, not a, not a negative parting gift, but he gave me a book on, uh, called Attachment. And I've written down the name because I couldn't remember Dr. Levine and Rachel Heller. Yeah. Um, it's the science of adulting, really. <laughs> it turns out I'm an avoidant. Attacher. Oh. Oh. So basically I just avoid commitment, which is okay. obvious. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so attachment. So I'm reading that just to understand and I'm okay. There's no wrong there's no wrong attachment style, but yeah. I'm a commitment phobe, which is okay. Very good. Attachment, the art, the art of adulting, is that what it is? Is that the, the, the science, science of, of adulting. adulting? Yeah, yeah, yeah. 
I'm only like two pages in, uh, yeah. to be honest. I'm, no, that's fine. I, I, I tend to read the news when I go to bed. Yeah. Um, I'm not really a big book person. No. Because I'm hyperactive. Yeah, okay. The Would books you, normally catch on fire. Was well, there anything that you do from a self-development piece or anything that stands out from the crowd in that space? Something that you might have recommended you, you turn to? Not really. I like I like I like Cotter's eight stages of change. Yeah. I use that. I don't use the same words as as they do, but um, yeah, that's kind of that's kind of my go to. It makes sense in whether it be prison, hostage negotiation, you know, in the boardroom, working in the banks. It actually doesn't matter. Stages of change are actually those eight stages. You, sh- you might just call them something different. Mm. So yeah, that's kind of my go to. Brilliant. Yes. What's one lesson that's taking you the longest to learn? Trust my intuition. Yeah. Instinct. Yeah. It's always right. It's always bloody right, annoyingly so. It is. Trust it, execute it fast. Yeah. If you could invite three people for dinner, who would they be? Oh, I thought about this one. So Ricky Gervais because oh, he cracks me oh, up. Just I, cracks me up. Quite literally my favourite comedian oh, in the world. 100%. He yeah. would have to come to the party because I love and, a good laugh. And not only just a comedian though, like such Smart. a deep thinker. Smart as. Smart as, as yeah. David Attenborough. Huge. He's just like, I mean, you know, I think he's like, was he like 100? Yes, he's up like, there. And he just, I could just close my eyes and, and fall asleep to him and the learning and just – Remarkable, one of the UK's biggest treasures of all time, along with the Queen. Yeah. Um, so he would definitely be there. And do you, can I just on? Do you, do you think Brian Cox is going to be the new David Attenborough? Do you know who Brian Cox is? No. Okay. There's, there's no. There's no, no David no, no. Attenborough. Okay. There will no one Let's can ever also, go there. David's book is the game changer, right? The, just the years thing that he did in his book. Did you read his book? No. No. He's basically talked about the the pollution and, and the ever like over the years what that what those metrics have been. Yeah. In his career, over the yeah. every decade in his career, yeah, and you can just see that like climate deniers cannot, they cannot challenge it because it's just based on data. Yeah, yeah, he's pretty special. Sorry, next and, person. And Henry Cavill. Oh yeah, the Superman. Yeah, oh, why wouldn't you? <laughs> <laughs> so I've got the. I got a crush on that guy. Yeah. Like, what, 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 he'd have to come in his Superman outfit. You know, he's just a very good distraction. So if we have any un- uncomfortable pauses. Yeah. I won't be well, uncomfortable. <laughs> you, you never know when you need a Superman. Oh, my goodness. Isn't he gorgeous? <laughs> um, what's some of the best advice that you've ever received? Don't drink yellow snow. <laughs> <laughs> Brilliant. Um, and, and probably honour your strategy, which was Andrew, actually, Andrew Cole. Yeah. Yeah, honour your strategy. And actually there was one other... Um, from another CEO who once said to me, he said, Claire, once you lose your integrity, you can never take it to bed again. Mm. And that actually, that one statement, um, I don't really think he realises how profound it was, mm. actually made that one hard decision that changed my life. Yeah, there you go. Yeah, just, just by saying once you compromise that, you'll never get it back and you can never invite it back. It's done. Yeah. It's lost and lost forever. Integrity isn't a gift that you can just invite in and out. You either have it or you don't. No. And I was like, whoa, profound. Brilliant. Well, that's it from us, everyone. Thanks again. We'll catch you next time. Thanks for listening to the podcast all. You can check out the show notes if there was anything of interest to you and find out more about us at synergyiq.com.au. I am going to ask, though, if you did like the podcast, it would absolutely mean the world to me if you could subscribe, rate, and review. And if you didn't like it, that's all right too. There's no need to do anything. Take care, guys. All the best.